In fact, when you look at the immune aspects, ablation could be a very affected stimulus of the body's overall anti-cancer immune response. Another huge advantage to ablation is just reducing tumor bulk so that immunotherapy and the anti-cancer immune response have a weaker opponent to attack. By reducing the size of the tumor, the patient has a better theoretical chance of immunotherapy working. In our war on terrorism model, ablation reduces the number of your enemy, weakening them, giving you access to intel which helps to better recognize, locate, and eliminate the terrorist. Though these early successes were significant and exciting findings, triggering the immune response to attack untreated tumors remained elusive. I was finding great success with the cryoblation technique on the tumors that I destroyed directly, but I wanted to determine how we could make this happen in almost every case. The initial answer, as it turned out, was in immune checkpoint inhibitors. Though these drugs combined with ablation may not be perfect, they were a huge advancement. Remember that the immune checkpoints are the key breaking mechanism of the immune system. And no matter how much you step on the gas, when the brakes are applied, you will go nowhere. Well, we have recently discovered, through some key animal research, there is a massive synergy between immune checkpoint inhibitors and ablation. We still need continued research in this area, but most studies point to cryoblation being more immunostimulating than other ablative techniques, such as radiofrequency and microwave ablation, which are heat-based. The main theory is that cryoblation, as it kills tumors, leaves more tumor pieces, antigens, attacked to be recognized by the immune system. This is certainly true. Though, there are several other aspects as well, but I will not burden you with this scientific details. In our war on terrorism analogy, you want to destroy the tumor, but leave evidence and other supplies intact, to use as intel to locate the other terrorists. If you blow everything to pieces, you destroy valuable information for tracking them down. If you kill with freezing, there will be more intact pieces than if you burn the place down. Continuing my quest to find a better solution, I began combining image-guided ablation, usually cryoblation, with the approved immune checkpoint inhibitors that were available at that time, Keytruda and Yervoy. One of the first cases we did with ablation and Keytruda was with the patient we would call LS. Her cancer was very advanced, with diffuse lesions of the lungs and bones and of the brain as well. Though what we did is very limited compared to what we do now, the amazing thing in her case is that not only did we see the lesions throughout her body disappear, but most, unfortunately not all, of her brain lesions went away. Shortly after Keytruda and Yervoy were approved, another PD-1 inhibitor, Optivo, was approved for cancer treatment. We found that our success was enhanced by treating patients with a single drug in combination with the ablation, but when we gave them a combination of two or more of the drugs along with the ablation, the results were outstanding. I think the combination of ablation and immunotherapy had been the biggest advance in cancer treatment in human history at that time, although today it has probably been supplanted by the combination of OX40, CPG, and Yervoy. I am hopeful that with this drug combination, along with new drugs that are continuing to be developed and approved, we will soon see a treatment that will cure the majority of cancer patients. One important aspect with ablation is that there are certain techniques which can make the difference between a positive anti-cancer immune response and no response. In some cases, the wrong technique can even hinder the anti-cancer immune response. Cryoblation tends to be more immune-stimulating than other techniques, but if the physician ablates too much at one time, the immune response may actually be inhibited, causing other tumors to grow faster. It is important for any physician performing cryoblation 
to understand how much is too much in order to create the best immune response. Some studies suggest that not ablating the entire tumor may be immunologically superior to ablating the entire tumor. There is probably a lot of viability on what is the exact size and volume of tumor to ablate. We have a better understanding now that there are indications that overzealous ablation or ablation of too much normal tissue, which occurs when trying to obtain clean margins, may actually be harmful in the long run. It seems that these aspects may lead to an increased healing response with release of growth factors and immune suppressive substances like TGFB, HGF, and VEGF. The techniques that we work with to enhance the immune response are related to reducing or actively blocking these substances. It has also been identified that these same aspects occur in standard surgery as well and may lead to the increase in future cancer spread. In surgery, the use of ketorolac, an anti-inflammatory drug, has been shown to reduce some of this risk. We use ketorolac injected into the ablation site, hopefully reducing this risk. I would like to add here that not only should ketorolac be considered with surgery or ablation to reduce the future spread of cancer, but for biopsies as well because the growth factors stimulated by surgery and ablation can also occur from biopsies. I find that it is important not to ablate too much tumor and certainly little to no normal tissue if possible. This only applies to advanced disease. When I am treating someone with only local early stage disease, it is necessary to ablate the entire tumor with the margin to reduce the risk of local recurrence. This is the same concept as surgical removal. However, when dealing with advanced disease, we are going to need an immune response if we hope to obtain a cure. So we perform the cryoablation using techniques to enhance the immune response. Though we are still learning what this may entail, our current understanding is that ablating too much tumor volume, too much normal tissue, or ablating a slow rate of freeze-all probably hurt the potential immune response. Often patients ask if surgery or ablation alone could be used for advanced disease. Though there may be certain exceptions, generally you would not do these procedures alone because in its advanced stage, cancer is systemic and requires a systemic treatment. For advanced cancer, I do not use ablation alone. It is always combined with immunotherapy injected into the ablated tumor. This is a systemic treatment. I have found that heat-based ablations using microwaves or radiofrequency are immune-stimulating, but probably not to the level that can be generated by freezing the tumor through cryoablation. But heat-based ablation seems to have less negative impact on the immune response for treating larger tumors, so they remain good techniques for reducing the size of large tumors. When we are dealing with large tumor bulk, reduction in size can be obtained with a heat-based ablation. Then we can perform cryoablation on a smaller area of tumor in order to enhance the immune response. This is done in conjunction with the injection of immunotherapy into the cryoblation tumor site. This combination of techniques effectively delivers a one-two punch to the tumor and provides a powerful immune-stimulating response. We are already working on drug techniques to eliminate any negative immune effects and further accentuate the positive aspects. It is possible new drugs may even eliminate the need for ablation altogether. Further research in this area will certainly lead to new changes in techniques and likely the devices we use to do the procedures as well. Research conducted by Dr. Michael S. Sabel at the University of Michigan has shown that the rate of freeze is very important for the immune response. Basically, Dr. Sabel showed that faster freezing was immune-stimulating, while slower freezing was immune-suppressing. For this reason, 
we changed the cryoblation device that we use, which previously was an argon gas-based system, to a liquid nitrogen-based system, iSense 3, Ice Cure, which has a faster rate of freeze. This system was originally designed for the breast, but now can treat anywhere in the body that cryoblation can typically be performed. Most cryoblation done in the US, and probably most of the world, is performed with argon-based systems, which may freeze at a slower rate. These systems are subject to changes in freeze rate based on the available gas pressures. One important aspect that I have observed with argon-based systems is that as you are doing the procedure, the pressure of argon in your tank will decrease. Ultimately, as the procedure goes on, you will have to change tanks to maintain pressure. As the pressure decreases, so does the rate of freeze. For me, this further adds reason to using a liquid nitrogen-based system where the rate of freeze remains constant. Certainly, more research needs to be done in this area, but I think the work done by Dr. Sabel is extremely helpful. This is enough information for me at the moment to only use a system that is known to freeze at a faster rate that remains constant throughout the procedure. In addition to injecting immune checkpoint inhibitors drugs in and around the ablated tumors, there are also numerous vaccines, adjuvants that can be used. Adjuvants are substances which help stimulate the immune response further. Standard vaccinations, such as the flu, often include an adjuvant because the killed virus or viruses pieces alone are often not sufficient enough to generate immunity. The same goes with cancer. There are many different adjuvant agents available to enhance the immune response. As I mentioned before, the excellent research by Den Brock et al. from the Netherlands has shown significantly improved results with the reduced future metastasis and recurrence in the animal model when combining cryoblation of a tumor with direct injection of saponin, which is a soap-like substance that comes from the soap bark tree in Chile. There is a commercially available modified form of this made by Novavax called Matrix M. Basically, these adjuvants enhance the delivery of the tumor pieces, antigens, to the immune system and dendritic cells. We have also used Monsonide ISA-51 made by Sepic. This is an oil-water vaccine adjuvant, which, in addition to being an adjuvant, it also seems to cause a slow-release delivery of the directly injected immunotherapy agents, such as the immune checkpoint inhibitors. One key aspect is that it is very helpful to mix the immunotherapy agents with something that helps keep it in the local tumor environment. We often use either monsonide ISA-51 or a hydrogel to achieve a depot effect in the tumor microenvironment. If you inject just a water-soluble drug, especially in a non-ablated tumor, much of the drug may exit the tumor microenvironment due to the increased blood flow often found with tumors, creating a washed-out effect. This is less of an issue injecting into a ablated tumor, as usually the blood flow has been cut off or reduced by the ablation process. This is another advantage offered by ablation. However, I still feel it is good to use an agent that will cause a slow release and keep the medication for an extended period of time within the tumor environment. Without going into too much detail of the science behind these findings, which you could find in the reference, the basic process involves killing the tumor with cryoblation that will simultaneously stimulate the immune system and adding vaccine adjuvants and immune checkpoint inhibitor drugs directly at the ablation site so that the typical aspects that will inhibit an effective immune response are blocked. This process creates an effective tumor vaccine, which, while not technically a vaccine against cancer that healthy people can use to protect against cancer cells forming in the first place, does act in the same way as a vaccine for those who already have cancer cells proliferating in their bodies. The effect is not just the elimination of cancer at the ablation site, but also the simulation of a complete response against all of that cancer cell type in the body. Essentially, the patient's own tumor has created a vaccine response in the body. 
Different than most vaccines, a vaccine made from your own tumor in your body is specific for you. It may also target numerous tumor antigens, giving the immune system antigen diversity. This way, even if a cancer tries to hide by mutating and disguising an antigen, this technique of ablation vax can have multiple targets, so the cancer typically would have to hide numerous antigens at once, which is far less likely to happen. This diversity contrast is different from, and superior to, typical off-the-shelf cancer vaccines or therapies such as original CAR-T, which only target one antigen. It is the difference between just having a photo of a criminal suspect versus having a photo, fingerprints, DNA, height, weight, scars, tattoos. The more identifying aspects you have on your suspect, the better chances you can locate them. And it may take more than just a change in hairstyle or growing a mustache to avoid being captured. The tumor may need to do more than hiding a few antigens, which is certainly a common escape mechanism for cancer to evade the immune system. This technique has shown a great initial response in cancer patients, and we are adding new combination of agents almost monthly. I have no doubt that ablation with the right combination of immune agents could cure cancer in a high percentage of patients. But the important point is that you understand that immunotherapy by itself or ablation by itself are not nearly as effective as the combination of the two together. There is no comparison. Just because a patient has failed immunotherapy alone or acquired ablation alone does not mean they cannot still be saved. If immune checkpoint inhibitors are removing the brakes of the immune system, then ablation is stomping on the gas pedal. To achieve the best outcome, both procedures must be done simultaneously. Only then can the patient's immune system get started in the right direction. I will add that as new combinations of immunotherapy are developed, maybe the ablation will become less necessary for stimulating the immune response. In the next chapter, you will learn more about some new exciting combinations of immunotherapy agents injected into the tumor, which is taking immunotherapy to a whole new level.